everyone deserves to have an endocrinologist fully understand all of the amazing metabolic processes that our bodies are performing. I'm Dr. Lindsay Van Dyke, and this is the Endo Days. Welcome back, and as always, thank you for joining me for a discussion about all things hormonal on the Endo Days. Today, we are continuing our discussion on the super hot topic of bioidentical hormone therapy. Last time, we reviewed the definitions of bioidentical hormones, and this time, I want to explore the role of compounding pharmacies in this field of medicine, because compounding pharmacies do account for about 3% of drug sales in this country. The number one thing I need to say is that compounding pharmacies and trained compound pharmacists are extremely valuable. It is important that individual patients with very specific needs have access to these resources in order to obtain the best treatment for their conditions when it is not available in the typical FDA-approved delivery method. Let's talk about a few examples. The first good example is a small child requiring a weight-specific dose of a medication that cannot otherwise be obtained in the usual tablets, capsules, injections, or syrups. In that situation, the pharmacist can mix up that drug in the correct dose in a method that that child can take. Another example is a patient who has a true allergy to a component in the commercially produced medication, and in this case, the compounding pharmacist can make the formulation without that offending allergen. The second point I need to make is that not all compounding pharmacies are created equal, and the selection of pharmacies should be done carefully because their regulation does fall into this weird gray area between state and federal regulation. Rather than direct oversight from the FDA, compounding pharmacies are governed by individual state boards of pharmacy, and not all are accredited by the Board for Compounding Pharmacies. There are approximately 7,500 of these compounding pharmacies in the United States, with 3,000 of those reportedly producing sterile compounds. Texas, where we are, for example, has some of the strongest laws governing compounding pharmacies, but they are still permitted to dispense compounds without the need for a prescription, and this is actually legal in 28 states altogether. Because state laws differ, there can be variability in quality when pharmacies outsource to other states. What does this mean? First of all, such pharmacies are not registered with the FDA as a drug manufacturer, which makes sense based on what we've discussed. And so they are not held to those same rigorous standards as the other commercially produced pharmaceutical products. Secondly, these pharmacies are not required to report bad side effects or what we in medicine call adverse events, nor are they required to pursue accreditation by the Pharmacy Compounding Accreditation Board, or PCAB for short. The FDA only gets involved in the business of a compounding pharmacy if there is a complaint. So why do we care about these things? Well, if you remember the news back in 2010, a compounding pharmacy in Massachusetts was responsible for causing at least 750 cases of fungal meningitis across 23 states that resulted in 64 deaths. Why? because that pharmacy was distributing contaminated products caused by improper sterile technique. So, in 2013, Congress responded by passing legislation called the Federal Compounding Quality Act, and that made three specific statements. Number one, pharmacies cannot compound copies of FDA-approved medications unless there is a shortage or A specific patient's need cannot otherwise be met. These are two examples that we discussed already. Number two, there are certain medications that the FDA has explicitly banned from compounding. And the best example of this for our conversation on hormones is a type of estrogen called estriol. Number three, Pharmacies must report adverse events or bad side effects when they sell in bulk or transport products across state lines. And these are those outsourcing pharmacies that I referenced earlier. 
It's good that such legislation was passed because these are all measures to keep patients safe. And safety is my primary concern as a doctor. From today's discussion, we can conclude that compounding pharmacies play a vital role in modern medicine. It is important that patients understand when compounding pharmacies are valuable resources and how to utilize them safely. So, to protect yourself, it is recommended that you choose a pharmacy that maintains accreditation by the Pharmacy Compounding Accreditation Board because this requires them to uphold strict standards in practice to safeguard the patients that they serve. Don't be afraid to ask your pharmacist if their facility is accredited by PCAB. On the final upcoming episode about bioidentical hormone therapies, we will review FDA recommendations for estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, and thyroid hormones using the guidelines issued by the Endocrine Society in 2016. In the meantime, if you are in need of a compounding pharmacy, you can find a list of organizations that are accredited by PCAB at www.achc.org. You can click on resources and events and then click on find a provider. You can then search for compounding pharmacies in the drop-down menu for your city and state. If you want to read more about compounding pharmacies, you can start at www.goodrx.com, where the blog has an article called, What are Compounded Medications? Or you can Google search for a question and answer sheet that was written by the FDA, and it's called Compounding and the FDA. Until next time, be well. Thank you.